You're not going to want to miss this episode of the AI Show where we delve into some of the ethical concerns with AI, how to think about it well, and what you can do today to make your software ethical if it uses AI. Make sure you tune in. Hello and welcome to this special edition of the AI Show. We're going to talk a little bit about ethics. I have some special guests with me. Let's start with you, Josh. Tell us who you are and what you do. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm Josh Lovejoy. I lead design for a team called Ethics and Society at Microsoft. Uh, what our team does is a little bit like a design agency meets ethics. Um, we partner with product teams like right in the mix of making actual products and try to collaboratively answer the question, what does it mean to be responsible? Awesome, Sarah. Hey, I'm Sarah Bird, and I am one of those product teams that's trying to figure out how to be responsible. So uh, I lead Responsible AI for the Cognitive Services, and we work closely with Ethics and Society to try to ensure responsible development and use of our products. So this is amazing. When it comes to machine learning and AI, you know, they, they're used interchangeably. When it comes to machine learning specifically, when I, when I think about ethics and machine learning, for some reason, and maybe others have said this too, I think it's a lot broader, but I've heard a lot that the ethics of machine learning models lies primarily only in the data. And if your data is unethical or you're using data wrong, but I've heard ethics centered around data, I feel like that's a little short-sighted. Josh, what do you say about that? Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Um, sometimes I relate it to a teaching metaphor, um, you know, machine learning, teaching, uh, saying that you're designing a system and all you have to do is make sure your data is right is like saying you're going to design a course to teach people stuff and all you have to make sure is that you have all of your references in order. Um, there's a lot more like who are your students and what are the subjects and what do they know already and where are they going to learn and all these different pieces that come to come to play a pretty significant role. Um, so data is super important, don't get me wrong, but uh, sometimes it misses a little bit of the bigger picture. So how do we frame this? Like, because I know when it comes to ethics, right, I, it's, it's all about literally the questions I ask myself before I do something. I feel like there's got to be a set of a large set of questions that we need to ask ourselves when we build AI or machine learning systems. Josh, yeah, and there's a there's kind of no shortage of questions. The first one is um, really just to your point. Like when we talk about ethics, the the first thing is what are you trying to build and for who? Um, you know, I might actually I, don't know, I might flip to some slides that I that I put together for this talk. Would that be cool? Let's do it. Sometimes we we start in this really like broad strokes picture about building technology, um, and people will show up with um, a really high level goal, you know, like a speech recognition or computer vision or what have you. Um, speech recognition, fantastic, overarching technical capability, literally trying to turn the sound of someone's voice into typed text so you can do stuff with it. Um, but then we end up with this, you know, with this sort of interesting uh, uh, friction question. Well, you know, how do we make this work for people and who actually needs to, to use it? Um, and this is where, as you said, Seth, there are a lot of questions, but also the kind of the roadmap towards getting a stronger connection between a technology, a set of capabilities and a set of people. Um, it's pretty unclear. Uh, you know, one of the things that our team tries to do is take on work, you know, working with folks like Sarah, when actually it's really unclear what the steps towards, you know, being responsible or building reliable technology looks like. If people have done it before, then it's a known known. But there are some things that are different about this space fundamentally um, that require us to really take this, this much more um, granular at times view of things. Um, and it starts by, I think, really just respecting the work that we're used to doing in engineering and we've kind of like neglected a little bit with machine learning for some reason. Um, one of them is just respecting and appreciating the types of constraints that we're working with. 
you know, physicists have all sorts of constraints that go into the work that they do, and electrical engineers have all sorts of constraints that go into the work that they do. But sometimes when we're building uh, AI and machine learning, we're just like 200,000 cores <laughs> that I want to run concurrently to build my, you know, 9 billion layer model, like whatever, like, let me do that. Um, and then when it comes to actually fit into a production system, we have a lot of weird uh, hacks that we have to that we have to employ. But the other one is accuracy, because accuracy is different fundamentally in machine learning than it is in traditional deterministic logic systems. You can't just say like, yeah, that's working as I intended it, because actually the the fundamental uh, value of machine learning is it's it's fuzzy, it's fuzzy logic. It's it's hunch building. It's not pr uh, truth building. Um, and so the addition that I'll throw in right off the top is like. Well, you have to learn how you measure not only accuracy, but also inaccuracy. And another way of saying that from kind of a human-centered perspective is you have to understand the things about people that should contribute to a more accurate system. You also have to understand the things about people that shouldn't contribute to inaccuracies in the system. And so let me let me let me get crazy for a second and then jump, put that in the system screen. Yeah, please, sir. Um, it seems like that gap can be huge, right? When you talk to our science teams and they're building a very general purpose model and some of the beauty is that can, it can be used in so many different cases, how does the team even start reasoning about where the limitations or, or the people that might use it if the whole, whole goal of AI is to build this very general purpose technology? It's a, it's a fantastic question. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I think um, I have two answers off the top. One, uh, the generalizability of machine learning is, I think, one of the most overstated things <laughs> in like the history of technology. It's uh, it's kind of like blows my mind when you think about um, what these systems can do and yet how brittle they end up being because of the again the nature of the the weights and biases that go into you know, multidimensional um, uh, hidden space. You know, there's hidden work and parameters that go into this. And so back to the like teaching metaphor, I still go back and I'm like, somebody could be an amazing teacher at reaching college students and they might suck at reaching preschoolers. Um, so the generalizability of machine learning is similar to the generalizability of teaching, which is to similarities. And I think we can get into those, but when, when you want to talk about accuracy and reliability, the specifics matter. I don't know what your experience has been like that, you know, sort of the, the, the types of starting points that teams come to you with, Sarah. Yeah, I think uh, going back to Seth's point, even about the data, right? Like there is a finite set of training data that's in this model. It probably works better for those use cases and not the use cases that you have no data representing it. And so, uh, I think getting out of this notion that it's general is a huge starting point in, I think, going further and thinking about how to uh, build this technology for people. So here's a question, because I, I love hearing this this discussion, you know, between the, the, the ethical considerations and the product. One of the questions I have is, like, I ha I'm having a hard time understanding, like, the question and, and the questions I should be asking myself. And I think the answer that I'm arriving at from what you're telling us is that it really depends on what you're building and who you're building it for, just like it does whenever you're building any software. Um, is that an accurate statement? And then you have a lot of other things in there with people that I'd love to understand. Because, like, I want to get to the point where if I'm building a machine learning system, I'm asking myself the right questions to maybe even consider this probably isn't the right thing to build using machine learning. I think that's spot on. Yeah, the, and the, the question, I mean, you, you're trying to sort of um, build a bridge in a way, you know, between what's at the outermost ring, Seth, that there are a set of capabilities that potentially feel magical, you know, the ability to actually reason about the, the visual space, you know, to turn vision into sound or vision into text or speech into text or speech into an understanding about physical space. There's all this incredible stuff that we can do. Um, and then you need to bridge this, this gap because 
you know, you meet people on the other side. Ultimately, you the value or the accuracy or the utility of your technology is measured by whether people like it or not and whether they find value in it. Um, and so starting with some of these first questions, I think it just exposes and we can get, I think there's, there's a bunch more questions baked in and we can, maybe we can riff through those really quickly. But even this just up front, like there's a difference between, for example, when you're building a speech recognition system to go to that example, um, what am I trying to accomplish at that point? What are my needs? Like, do I need to be better understood by a group or by uh, an individual that I'm trying to relate with? Are we speaking the same language? Um, am I um, trying to make a good impression of these people I know? Um, who am I? Do I speak, tend to speak loudly or quietly? Do I perceive myself as having an accent? Not everyone does. This is one of my favorite conversations with my kids. <laughs> They're like, Dad, we don't have accents, do we? And I'm like, no, no check your entitlement for a second buddy like you just don't realize it um and uh and so these types of questions and then maybe one that might jump out to your viewers is this social identities question like stuff's gonna fail technology's failed for us for forever we have a long relationship with like you know if you tried turning it off and on again but when something fails for you because of something that you kind of feel is very personal like maybe your gender identity or maybe your race or ethnicity or maybe a practice or a tradition that you have, maybe a way you dress. Um, those are things where sometimes it can start to cross this line and you're like, wait, is it me? Did they build for me? Did they not build for me? Does the world not believe that this was meant for me? And those are hard questions that I, not for a second, I don't believe that's the starting point for any engineer or data scientist or research scientist, I don't think anybody sets out to exclude. There's just a lot of stuff that's buried. Um, and maybe we could take a pass through some of these layers and look at some of those issues that, that maybe end up getting taken for granted too often. Yeah, I would love to see the, the layers because I like, like I, I love the, I love the, the, we're building stuff for people, so maybe we should start with them. Uh, but like, for example, context, environments, apps, edge, like I'm not understanding like, like how's, what does that mapping look like to people? So maybe if we can go through some of the layers so, so the viewers can get a sense for what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then maybe as we're, as we're going through, Sarah, I think you bring so much direct practical experience working with product teams, maybe like yeah. adding on, I think some of that specific, like what you're seeing in practice um, could be really, could be really great to, to hear. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so, so the first thing about this, this system, um, is each successive ring you could think of like a dependency for the, um, or has a dependency on the prior ring. So as we move out to context, we still carry with us those questions. We haven't made, built our bridge yet to technology, like to know whether or not in the speech recognition case, if we can effectively turn spoken words into typed text. But we, we start to get a bit closer and we build. Okay, so if we know the people, and we kind of know some of their characteristics and we know some of their needs, well, then it gets into this question of jobs to be done and things like dynamics. So it's like, you know, it's a very different scenario if there's three of us kind of jamming on some stuff going back and forth and maybe it's good if there's kind of crosstalk and some overlap. Um, whereas if somebody's presenting um, and doing more kind of one to many, I think you'd have some pretty different dynamics in terms of expectations um, uh, for you know what you should pick up on and the types of accuracy or measurement, um, but also like the specific types of transcription or whatever. Like that, that'll that'll change if you need to understand whether I'm say a doctor who's trying to prescribe something, and so the vocabulary or the lexicon I'll use is really different than if I'm a teacher or if I'm in uh, an environment with other people talking about a technical domain, so much jargon and so many things that go into that, that the jobs to be done has to really brought to, be brought to bear to know how you would measure accuracy and usefulness. I see, and how do we take this into account with our, with our products, Sarah? It's very interesting because in essence, we are starting a lot more at that technology layer, right? We have something that, uh, powers many different products inside of Microsoft as well as uh, customer products. And so uh, being kind of that, that lower outer layer, what we really have to do is 
work closely with um, the Microsoft products that are incorporating our models or with the customers to actually understand some of the answers to these questions and, and really understand what are we trying to achieve by deploying this technology. Okay, and so let's let's move to environments and let's see if we can rifle through these because I want to get a really good picture of like what I should be thinking because when I see things like environments, apps, and ed like you're using these words in, in ways that, that I had never considered, and so this is super interesting. Cool. Yeah, I think the 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 closer to people we get, the closer it kind of gets to more sort of social sciency or user experiencing type of thinking, and you'll see we get a little bit more towards the engineering stack, and I think that that transition happens here where we, you know, we'd all agree at an environmental level, if we're in a noisy room versus a quiet room, those parameters should have a fundamental difference on the quality of speech recognition. They also need to be taken into account. So if you're building a, a you know, an app or a model that should work in, say, helping me get directions while I'm driving and I can speak to my car, you need to have really different kind of ambient uh, audio uh, detection than in, uh, say, a transcription, you know, note to self kind of application environment. So those environments play a significant role. Jumping on a layer again to that app level, and this is where I think the the biggest transition starts to happen because you get stuff like, okay, well, how will people interact with this? Are these like swipes? Is it a touch target? Is there are there devices that are actually just sort of um, you know, uh, attached to parts of the room? Is it my, you know, is it something that's always listening? Um, is, uh, do I have a feedback mechanism that I actually am playing with? Can this thing learn from me? How do I know what it does? Um, and this is the, this is like the most central layer in like the human computer interaction part of the, of the system where you'll get these big mismatches and you know, what we think of as like the conceptual model of a user and the conceptual model of the engineer who built it. You know, uh, think about like thermostats. You know, for forever you just dialed this thing farther to the right when you wanted it hotter and farther to the left when you wanted it colder, but you had no notion of how quickly it would get hotter or how quickly it would get colder. And people would do these crazy things of dragging it to the slider all the way to the side because they wanted to, they thought it might speed up the rate that the room would get hotter or colder, which is not true. But again, there's no feedback to the to the user in that process. We have to think about that stuff when we're thinking about optimizing these models. Because again, if nobody can improve the quality of the speech recognition over time um, and they just have to you know, receive the results of it, then how are they going to build confidence? And if they can't build confidence, are they actually want to keep using it? Yeah, and I think this, this layer is probably one of our biggest opportunities um, in practice where we both can really use it as a way to better contextualize potential errors that the model's making, as well as allow us to kind of learn and understand where the model is failing. So if we really lean into that app layer and, and co-design with the model and the technology, I think there's a lot more we, we really could do. And uh, in some cases, it's been a bit neglected. Yeah, as a, as a designer, that's definitely been my experience. Um, there's a little like, let's assume that everything in the model is right, and then people will just get the results of it. And it's like, well, what happens when it's wrong? Because that's it's going to happen. It's like yeah. guaranteed to happen with machine learning. Um, you know, moving to the, and considering considerations for the actual device that you're going to use, um, you know, again, brings up more of these questions. You know, speech recognition is, is another one just to, to continue riffing on, like the difference between like an omnidirectional mic versus a cardioid mic versus a you know a shotgun mic or whatever types of um, of detection range and proximity that you would need in order to, to sustain um, a consistent um, volume for good transcription recording. Um, the uh, you know the types of processing capabilities that you might have? Do you have on-device models that you're able to run to do things like attenuation of background noise or pre-processing to determine, say, if there's um, certain wake words or something that you want to bake into it that actually should have um, downstream effects for the which model might get kicked off into? Um, lots of stuff to ask at this layer. Um, again, getting closer and closer into um, Things that typically we talk about through the lens of like engineering reliability, but they're still critical when you're trying to say, you know, how do I train my model? What is acceptable loss given 
all these considerations. So as Same we go thing. up to stack, as we go up to stack, just as and I'm sorry, because one of yeah, the orthogonal concerns that I'm not seeing is like, for example, if I'm thinking about jobs to be done, I might be building an application for adults versus children versus people that are older. Uh, I, I didn't I don't see anything about the questions of because this is going to sound wrong, and I, I don't want to sound wrong because I want to get the, the right ethics, but you, you basically, once you get to the jobs to be done, are you not starting to segment people into who your target audience is? How do you do that in an ethical way? Oh, that's a, that's a really, really, really important question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, I'm sort of <laughs> hesitant to dig in like with all these different ideas in the screen, so audience, bear with us. But... Um, there's uh, there's kind of a mistake that we're working our way backwards from. Um, and some of it has to do with um, an over-indexing on political correctness. There was this belief for quite some time, and I think we probably, all three of us might have grown up in this era, where it was easier to just say, I don't see color, or I don't see gender, or we're all just the same and everyone should be treated equal. Um, and to to want to believe in that type of a um, of a of a dynamic um, is quite alluring. Like that's a really you know nice nice you know set of attributes and ideals to try to encode in a, in a generation of kids. Um, you know, and I think our our parents wanted you know they did that because they wanted to believe that their efforts in, you know, progressive movements and whatnot have like manifested in, in a healthier, more equitable future. It's, it's not wrong. Those aren't bad ideals, but it's not realistic. Uh, human beings do have differences. <laughs> like we do judge each other. We do take into considerations our past experiences and build stereotypes about the future for right or for wrong. Um, but those are, those are attributes that it would be wrong for us to say, um, everyone is exactly the same and we all have the same background because that itself actually marginalizes the experiences of people who have been historically forgotten. And there's just too many people who have been historically forgotten because it's too uncomfortable to start calling out by name the fact that we've forgotten them for so long. So to your point, Seth, like, when you start to build these groups, it is not a comfortable activity. I'm sure Sarah can speak to this on the product team side. I'm, I'm curious sort of like the way that, that you know, you're helping groups start to wake up to that, that need to actually sort of segment, not for the purposes of judging people, but for making things more equitable. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's really, as you said, in sort of an uncomfortable exercise and that it's very different than what we're used to doing. And so a lot of the work is just, how do we even start thinking about this? How do we think about the the groups of people the technology is designed to work for? And, and how do we add that next group and that, you know, next consideration? And uh, it's definitely, it's definitely a very different way of thinking than when we're trying to sort of think about the technology agnostic to the, the so what I'm hearing. All right, I will say ahead. one thing just, just to, to build on what Sarah is saying. Um, one of the things that we require is it's like for our team, for ethics and societies, whenever we partner with a product team, we, um, we go through this exercise of trying to imagine kind of potential futures, both positive and, and not so positive futures, um, and ask ourselves who's not involved, like who's not part of the conversation. Um, and then when we do our research, we intentionally overrepresent those groups. Uh, and we've, we've been building out this kind of like, it's kind of wacky. It's like a giant spreadsheet of like different ways that people identify. Um, because depending on the jobs to be done, depending on the context, depending on, you know, even the devices, like how expensive the device might be, um, and who might have access to reliable service and, you know, where you're going to get the data from all these different layers they call into question who was involved and how early were they involved. Um, so, so we do have to we do have to kind of expand our our default settings um, of uh, being able to categorize people because counterintuitively we want to develop for a future 
where nobody should have to change something about themselves to make a technology work for them. So I have this, there's this notion that I've been developing in my head, you know, because I, I grew up the same way. Everyone's the same. Uh, but there's a, there's a huge difference between equality and equity. They're, they're different things, right? Um, one has to do with outcomes and one has to do with opportunities, right? And, and, and I understand that. But how do I ethically, for example, when I'm thinking about the technology that I want to build and the jobs to be done, how do I ethically look at both of those concerns, orthogonal concerns that I think are, with the people and the jobs to be done? How, how do I do that? Because obviously, for example, if if you want to if you want to cater to a segment of the population, like for example, there's programmers that are blind. I've met them; they're amazing. But you have to consciously think about that segment of the population when you're building a product. How do you how are you inclusive when you build these kinds of things, and at the same time have the time to build something? Because you can't build something for everybody. There's just not enough time. How do you ethically build for what you can? To start, do you see what I'm getting at? Absolutely, um, absolutely. And I think the the different ways that you're trying to like kind of maneuver through even those words highlights just how weird this conversation ends up being. And so, the first thing is to um, is to not judge each other for the stuff we don't know. Like the the reality is like if you want to like paint this full image of all these different rings of considerations. Um, Building a product is messy. There's never enough time. You're always bound by certain constraints. And so you're, the, the dilemma you should be faced with isn't um, let's get this perfect so that it's going to work for all people. It's let's go through the activity of describing the things that should contribute to accuracy and shouldn't contribute to inaccuracy. So we at least can say, here are the limitations of the technology we're building. There's no perfect. And this is part of the issue, kind of going back to like AI being like a little overhyped in terms of its generalizability. Like we might get to a point, you know, where meta learning and transfer learning and, you know, we'll have like, uh, multi-head adversarial networks that will somehow build in resource management systems and reinforcement learning can somehow take us to a spot where we've got entropy built into systems such that they need resources to, you know, keep on going and robots essentially mimic humans. We could get there. Also, we have what we have right now, which are systems that are often quite brittle and a, le a series of layers and questions that we just haven't built up a good set of musculature as teams for how to talk about. So what I'm saying to your question, Seth, and it's a fantastic question, isn't, uh, isn't actually like uh, that we can solve it. It's we have to embrace how imperfect what we're gonna make is, and then be specific about who we're gonna make sure it does work well for. I see. So Sarah, a quick question. Well, not a quick question, because it's gonna be a long answer, I think. <laughs> how, how, do you, how does the product group engage with these kinds of questions how do you how do you work together with with our ethics division i'm saying ethics division like you know like, like it's a baseball team or something yeah, how, we all how, suits and what does that look like like that yeah you know i think thinking about what josh was just saying as well probably the most significant uh thing that we've been doing is just changing how we, we think about the products we're building and how we think about the technology. And um, for something that's a more general platform technology like the cognitive services, the most freeing thing has been really leaning into why are we building this tech? Like, what is it for? What do we want to achieve? And then being much uh, more comfortable and open about the limitations of it. And I think, in fact, that's in a lot of cases uh, led to actually just a lot of clarity in the product group's thinking and led to kind of more innovation because they're like, oh, oh, that's what we're doing? If we're doing that, we could add this feature and that feature and that would be really cool and customers would love it. And so uh, a lot of it is just really even focusing on like, 
Why does this product exist? Why did we build it? Who's it for? And then after that, uh, there certainly are uncomfortable conversations around, well, who is it for and who is it not working well, but it should be for. But with that kind of framing, at least we're on a path to starting to say, okay, well, it should work well for this group of people. And uh, we haven't checked that. And so we might have some very unexpected errors, which is, I think, basically the norm is what we found is the errors manifest in very, very surprising ways. And so uh, first with that more principled thinking, then we can start going and doing our normal product work, designing tests to line up with that goal, designing, uh, you know, release criteria that lines up with the, the reason the technology exists and who's it, who is it for. And so uh, it's, been, it's been a great journey to, together with the ethics team, think more about how we build that thinking around impact and the purpose of a technology into our thinking from the beginning. And there's lots of open questions, but it's definitely helped create clarity for, for us and how we move forward. So I've never had an, like an ethics person on the show. And so here's <laughs> a pet peeve that I've always had with, with machine learning. And I wanna see, I wanna run it by you all and, and tell me if I'm if my thinking is right. I personally can't stand when people anthropomorphize machine learning models because my inner self is telling me that it allows people to disclaim liability or or to to move the ethics needle over to the machine when it re really is a human who controls those things. Am I wrong here? Should I not be upset about that? <laughs> It's actually one of the biggest complaints about the term responsible AI, because it's not that we want the AI to be responsible. We want to build it responsibly and we want to use it responsibly, right? And so it's really uh, developing AI responsibly, not responsible AI, but uh, the term is what it is. Josh, yeah, the, do you the, want to uh, a real question? No, it's, it's, a re it's a really good question. I, um, we've tried to look at that issue, Seth, from a couple of different perspectives. Um, one, uh, we just sort of have this little axiom on the team. We say the fidelity of the AI should not exceed the fidelity of the capabilities. So when you anthropomorphize something, you are, for all intents and purposes, representing its capabilities as being human level, and they're not. Um, so, so that's one issue that we would call a, maybe an ethics issue because you're, you are implicitly over representing the capabilities of this thing. There's other stuff about like relationship formation, uh, which I think goes to both the points that you were making, uh, each of you were making about who is the responsible party, you know, is our goal and it could be a goal, but is our goal to help people build better relationships with robots? Like that could be the goal, but let's be explicit about that goal. You know what I'm saying? Like that's that's gotta be a difference between in these rings, you talk about the, you know, the data sources and the optimization goals and the architecture. When it when it actually when we're at that layer and we're talking about building a synthetic voice, the optimization goals for that synthetic voice is how well they deceive people into believing that it's a real person. That's the measure. It's a subjective measure um, where people listen to a voice and they rate it from a one to five scale of uh, realisticness. And when it hits that top scale and they basically are like, yeah, I'm listening to a person, you've won, you've succeeded, you've optimized your model to a point where your loss is sufficient. Um, and, and that's something we have to unpack. If that's your intent is to deceive people and to potentially overrepresent their functionality so that they can build a relationship with a robot, that is, uh, that's different than if it's right or wrong. It's just, is it your intent? I see. So I, w we've had a long discussion and we should definitely do this again because I, there's a lot more stuff, but I wanna make sure that there, we, we keep this tight. Sarah, could you maybe like really quickly go through like this onion with maybe a product that we built and how you've considered all these things? Mm -hmm. Just, I know I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I'm actually hoping you'll let us come back and do that with some of our upcoming releases that we can't talk about this week. Um, cool. so can I take a rain check on it? Absolutely, yeah. because I would love to, because for me, like this is all super highly conceptual, but I'd love to see like, and maybe we'll do this down the road, where we go through a product and you can see like, oh, I see how this maps here. I see how this maps here. I see how this maps here. And I see how now as a 
we're being holistically ethical while at the same time being imperfect, which is what we only can do. I mean, we we can strive for perfection, but we will probably never reach it. But I love to to see how this actually maps. So to finish up, because I want to make sure that that uh, people can digest this episode, Josh, what's the key takeaway here from an ethical perspective? And then Sarah, last word: How are we taking this to heart when we build AI products, Josh? Yeah, thanks. It's a great it's a great question, and and thanks again for having us. I think the the top thing I would I would hope folks take away is to be ethical or the start of a journey of being ethical is not even really about right or wrong or the moral values or what have you. There's lots of time and, uh, and consideration needs to go into that. It's about saying what you're going to do and then doing what you're going to say. Uh, the, the ability to be intentional, to start with a purpose and then follow that purpose through and be clear about where there are limitations about how accurately or reliably you were able to deliver on that purpose. That's really the, the bedrock. Um, and I think that's really within the capability of any developer or engineer or scientist that's working in this domain. Um, and so I would ask you to go seek out your neighborhood UX designer or UX researcher and engage in a conversation on that subject because we've got a lot of ideas and hopefully we can help you meet people where they're at. Sarah. Yeah, I think um, for us, the biggest, most concrete change has just been starting with a purpose. Why are we building this technology? And then everything else in the in the diagram kind of falls out from there, right? When you have a clear purpose, uh, it's easier to even ask some of the hard questions and to make some of the, the more challenging trade-offs. And so uh, I'm going to come back on the show and talk more about all of the specific technologies that we'll be announcing uh, next week at Ignite and also, uh, you know, moving forward in general so we can get really specific about for each technology what we've done and what does it look like to put this into practice. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. And again, dear viewer, thank you so much for watching. We've been learning all about the ethics of AI, and I think it boils down to what are we going to do and are we going to stick to it? It's pretty cool. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Take care.